I don't know if you know this, but today is the 541st day since the very first COVID lockdown in March of 2020. 541 days. I don't know how that number strikes you. When I first read it, it hit me in two very different ways right away. The first, uh, I read the number and I thought, that is an enormous number. We have been living like this for a very long time. But then immediately, my second reaction was, that number doesn't seem big enough. (laughs) Given all that we've experienced, it feels to me like that number should be so much bigger. Krista just now defaults to saying two years. The pandemic has lasted two years. And like I said, with everything that we've gone through, it feels like it's been two years and probably more. It feels like it's been an eternity. And so it's kind of in that spirit 541 days in, on the verge of another fall, on the verge of kids going back to school, us starting a new ministry year, and at the same time, on the verge of potentially wave four and all the uncertainty that that brings, we thought we would spend this Sunday calling a bit of a time out and kind of thinking about and reflecting on our experience over the last 541 days and bringing it to God. And so this morning, we're not going to do what I usually do and preach a 20-minute sermon and whatever. This morning is going to look a little different. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes as we think about some of the things we've experienced in COVID, and then um, we're going to spend some time bringing that prayerfully and reflectively to God, and then we'll sing a song And then I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes more, but something else about our experience with COVID. And then we're going to, again, bring that prayerfully and reflectively to God. And then we'll celebrate communion together as a community and and hopefully kind of take stock of where it is and where God is in everything that we've experienced in the last 77 weeks uh, of meeting like this. And so to start off this morning, I want to open up our Bibles to a a book of the Bible that I have actually, in 30 years of preaching, I have never preached a single message, not a single verse out of this book of the Bible. It's a book of the Bible called Lamentations. But as I was thinking about this morning, I was thinking it's probably the perfect book of the Bible to do some reflecting on what we've been experiencing because the book of Lamentations is a series of poems that was meant to grieve all that the author and his people were experiencing at the time these poems were written. They were written to grieve the fall and destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 587 BCE and the exile of almost the entire Jewish population from the land of Israel to the land of Babylon, which is in like modern day Iraq. And The point of the poems is just to articulate and give voice to all of the pain and suffering that these communities and people had experienced. As their city lay waste in ruins, the governmental leadership had disappointed and then disappeared. Families were separated from each other by the exile. People were anxious and worried about the well-being of their loved ones. And most fundamentally, maybe, people's faith was shaken as they were asking, where's God in all of this? And right around the middle of the book, in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19, the writer says this, the memory of my suffering and homelessness, the, the way the world changed forever, the memory of my suffering and homelessness is bitterness and poison to his soul. I can't help but remember and am depressed. After two and a half chapters of giving voice to all of the pain that they've experienced in these traumatic events, the writer says, my my suffering, the way I've experienced dislocation has become bitterness and poison in my soul. And he said, my mind continues to race about it. I can't turn my brain off. And the more I think about it, the more depressed and despairing I get. And I can imagine that there are a number of us who can resonate with those feelings. For some of us, it's as we remember our medical experiences, whether we ourselves have lost our own health or 
have maybe lost loved ones to COVID-19. Or for those in our community who are also a part of the healthcare community, who have experienced the trauma of working in that environment and the moral injuries caused by treating COVID patients. For some of us, the despair, the depression, the sadness, the grief is all kind of experienced around the way we've experienced mental health in the last 17 months. Whether that's the the crushing loneliness and isolation or the anxiety about our health or our kids, um, what the pandemic has done to those who grapple with addiction. For some of us, the sadness and the grief is more of a family shape. The way we've been separated by travel restrictions from people that we love for long periods of time or for others, the way we've been trapped in dysfunctional family dynamics and unable to escape or get relief. For many, it's just the challenges of sorting out family life when work and school and life all happen in the same place or making arrangements so they can all happen. For some of us, the sadness and the grief comes out of sort of relational trauma that we've experienced. I think one of the legacies of COVID, aside from the uh, the toll that it's taken on people's health and on their lives uh, in terms of mortality, I think COVID is going to leave a a stream of broken relationships in its wake. For some of us, the pain and the sadness comes more out of the financial experience that we've had. We've lost income or jobs or businesses. Some of us have lost everything. Some of us have lost our place to live. For some of us, the pain and the sadness comes out of uh, the losses associated with faith. We've lost the support structure of our faith. We've lost the programs. We've lost the community. We've lost the regularity of worship. We've lost being in relationship with people. We've lost the opportunity to volunteer. We've we've, uh, found ourselves immersed in questions and doubts and how can God allow all of this? And there's just this pain associated with what we've experienced over the last 541 days and it's hard to turn your brain off and the more we think about it the deeper the sadness gets but this is why I wanted to turn to the book of Lamentations because here's where the writer of Lamentations finds himself he says uh, in verse 21 I call all of this to mind therefore I will wait what does he call to mind Certainly, he says, the faithful love of the Lord has not ended. Certainly, God's compassion isn't through. They are renewed every morning. He breaks into prayer. He says, great is your faithfulness, God. And then he reflects and says, I think the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I'll wait for him. Psalmist says in the, or the writer of Lamentation says, in the midst of all the pain and the despair and the trauma and the ache and the grief, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn to lean into the goodness of God. He says, I'm going to remember that God's faithful love isn't over. The Hebrew word is chesed. And it refers to God's faithful commitment to show up in loving kindness and action on behalf of God's people. And the writer says that God is still that kind of God. He says, I remember that God's compassion in Hebrew, the racham of God, the the tender mercies of God, they're not over. It's sort of this, this tenderness of heart, this deep emotional maternal bond that is the driving force behind all of God's kindness and faithful commitment. And the writer says, what I remember is that the God is the same God today as God has always been. And in all the ways that I and we have experienced the faithful commitment and the loving, tender, motherly commitment of God, um, That is still real. Like the sunrise, God renews God's commitment to us every single morning. Even if faithful as the sunrise is, even if at times it's hard to see. And in those moments, the writer says, when you know in your head that God is 
committed and faithful and that God loves you with a tender maternal love in those moments when you know it, but you can't see it. What you have to do is wait just like the sunrise. It is coming. And if you can learn to wait in hope, eventually the light will conquer the darkness. And so this is what he says. The Lord is good to those who hope in God to the person who seeks God. It's good to wait in silence for the Lord's deliverance. He says, this this is my commitment. I know that those who are committed in faithful trust to God, they will see the goodness of God. Those who are actively seeking God's goodness, they will see the faithful commitment and tender a maternal love of God for real in their lives. And so he says, it is good to wait in silence for God to show up. Now, he doesn't mean when he says wait in silence, he doesn't mean that, you know, don't pray, don't cry out to God, don't even complain or have questions or doubts. He's two and a half chapters into doing all of that. What he means is I am going to wait in a posture of expectant hope, in the trust of knowing that God's faithful commitment, God's tender maternal love will show up if I wait for God. And so friends, that's my invitation to all of us this morning. We're going to take a minute right now and just in all of our locations, we're going to take a minute and we're going to pause reflectively We're going to adopt a posture of waiting in silence and hoping, living in that expectant hope that God's faithful commitment and God's tender maternal love has never changed, is new this morning, and the light of God's love will conquer the darkness of these times. Let's sit and wait. The weight of grief we've all been carrying is not insignificant. And perhaps the imagery of literally carrying something could help us to process that. So I'm gonna invite you into a posture prayer with me as a way of letting our bodies help us with our praying. Now this practice would probably be best if you actually stand up to do it. So if you're able to do that wherever you are, you might find it helps. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to hold your arms out in front of you like this and cup your hands. And as we do this, I want us to consider the grief we've been holding in all the areas that Michael named just now. And we're going to imagine that we are holding it physically in our hands. So you ready? Okay, join me and hold your hands out. Hold them out far. You can close your eyes or keep them open, whatever helps you focus best here. Now, perhaps your grief has been tied directly to the medical realities of the pandemic. Whether because you work in the war zone of healthcare, because you've actually lost a friend or a family member to COVID, or in the midst of COVID. Perhaps you've lost part of your own physical health in some way. That's grief. Allow yourself to feel it and to hold its weight in your hands. Feel it for yourself, for those you love. Feel it for the world. Maybe your grief has been tied more to internal difficulties. Maybe a loss of mental health and stability, a loss of peace, and just a feeling of safety in the world. Loss of hope. Maybe your own internal sense of emotional equilibrium. Do you feel that weight? I mean, these are heavy things to carry. So picture them physically there in your hands right now. For yourself, for those you love, and for the world. Let's hold it. Maybe you've been grieving relational pain whether relationships that have literally ended, 
or maybe just become so strained under the current reality that they're just not what they once were. And that hurts. Can you feel that? If lockdowns and restrictions have actually forced you into more proximity with relationships that are hurtful and harmful, I mean, feel the weight of what you've been carrying there and hold that weight in your hands right now for yourself, for those you love, for the world around us. For many, the biggest loss they've experienced has been tied to economics. Maybe that's you. Whether a loss of employment, loss of your business, savings being drained, maybe actual bankruptcy. I mean, these things are a big deal and they have been for so many. Let's just add that weight onto the others in your hand. For yourself, for those you care about, and for the world. I mean, can you feel how much heavier your arms are becoming right now? For some, the biggest losses to grieve have been or have become spiritual. So has your faith struggled at all? Has it become anemic feeling with the, the loss of so many of our programs and in-personness, our togetherness? You feel like your face disappeared completely. Have you asked the question, where is God again and again? And heard no answer. Maybe that's a grief and a weight you've been holding to. So let's do that for yourself, for those you care about, and for the world. You know, I've even heard the term ambiguous loss, naming a a subtle but pervasive just sense of deep sadness. You know, that the world has seemed to change overnight and, and people just don't even know which way is up anymore. I have felt that. And so we can hold that one too. And let ourselves feel its weight. I mean, this is almost unbearably heavy, isn't it? In Psalm 31.10, the writer says, my body withers under the weight of this suffering. And perhaps you're feeling that right about now in your arms. That's the same Psalm actually that Jesus quoted from the cross when he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was trusting and waiting for God to deliver him from the most profound pain imaginable. Maybe we're waiting for some of the same. And so if indeed, as Michael said earlier, it is good to wait in silence, then let's take 30 more seconds to just sit in silence. Allow your arms to keep feeling that weight. And most importantly, allow your heart to grieve your losses. And then at the end of the 30 seconds, when the song begins to play, as your own act of trust and hope, just let your arms go. Release that weight to God, trusting in God's ability to hold all of those things and to hold you as you sing. Faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you. You're the Lord of all creation. 
creation Still you know my heart The author of salvation You've loved us from the start We're waiting here for you With our hands lifted high in praise It is you we adore Singing You're everything you've promised Faithfulness is true And we're desperate for your presence All we need is you We're waiting here for you With our hands lifted high In praise it is you we adore singing I trust that in the midst of these moments that maybe you could even already to begin to sense the presence of God 541 days into this pandemic. Now, there's a lot of ways in which our experience of COVID has been unique to all of us. We've experienced the pain and the trauma of it differently, but there is one way that I want to talk about this morning that we've all experienced it together, and I think we need to name it and address it if we're going to move together from this place as a community, and that's the pain and trauma of disrupted relationships, something we've all experienced. See, in the last 541 days, we've all had different experiences of the pandemic, right? Just think about, for example, a person who um, is either, you know, has gotten sick with COVID or lost a loved one to COVID or is immunocompromised or works in healthcare. Imagine that person's experience of the last 17 months compared to somebody who is young and relatively healthy and didn't get sick and didn't really know anybody that got sick. Their stories, their, their experiences of the last 17 months are going to be completely different. We've had different perceptions of the last 17 months. Different parts of our community have tapped into different sources of information who have reported with different levels of accuracy. And now we have different understandings of what's happened over the last 17 months. And it, it can actually be hard to imagine how somebody who understands these circumstances differently than you, how they could even how they can't see, you know, what you see. Um, we've had different priorities, different values, each of us in the last 17 months. For some of us, the last 17 months have literally been about our physical health and either protecting ourselves or recovering. For some of us, the last 17 months have been about mental health. For others of us, the last 17 months have been primarily financial concerns or family concerns or concerns about the kids. We've, we've had different priorities in how we've processed. And so since we have different experiences and stories and different perspectives and different priorities and values, what has happened is we've all made different decisions when it comes to navigating the pandemic. But, but here's what that's created. I've had lots of conversations in the last 17 months, and probably so have you, with people who have said that they have felt judged, disrespected, um, even rejected because of the decisions they made, 
because of COVID. And in some of those conversations, people were telling me that it was me who had made them feel that way. And when people feel that way, when they're afraid of being judged and rejected, then what we do is we retreat into our own little camps. We circle the wagons with the people who think like us and and understand things like us and understand us in order to protect ourselves and to protect our feelings. And we withdraw in relationships from family and friends. Communities have been shattered. Churches have experienced division because of the ways that we've retreated into our camps to protect ourselves from judgment and projection because of the ways that we have responded to COVID. And that's as true in our church as it is anywhere. And honestly, friends, if we're going to move forward as a community from this entire experience, it's only going to be if we can make one commitment to each other. That by God's grace, we will give grace to each other. I think that looks like a lot of things, but I'm going to suggest two this morning. It means giving each other the grace of extending mercy rather than judgment. In Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 1, Jesus says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The, the rabbis used to say that God had two ways of measuring a life. There was a measure of judgment and a measure of mercy. Those were God's two options. And God would choose which way God was going to measure a person's life, your life, my life. Whether with judgment or mercy, God would choose based on what God saw us choose. If we were people who extended judgment to others, then God would use the measure of judgment on us. But if we were those who extended mercy to others, then God would extend mercy to us. I think the only way that we as a community are going to be able to move forward together is if we can learn to extend mercy to each other in the way that we are navigating these moments, to understand that our experiences and our stories are different, that our perspectives are different, that our priorities and values are different, that the battles that we're fighting are different, and to understand, therefore, that the decisions that we're going to make are going to be different, and to allow that to be okay. Remember Tom Lowen saying months and months and months ago that at the end of the day, knowing that we're all doing the best that we can with the the way that we're trying to navigate COVID, Tom said, regardless of the dialogue that we have, and there is room for constructive back and forth and mutual disagreement and so on where it's welcomed and, and appropriate, But Tom said, underneath all of the conversation about COVID, there should be one fundamental commitment as we make the decisions that we need to make. It's that we will look each other in the eyes every time somebody makes a decision and we will say to them, that must have been a hard decision. I'm proud of you. Imagine if we could be the kind of community that could give each other the grace of extending mercy. Here's the second thing. What if we could give each other the grace of extending acceptance? In Romans chapter 15, the Apostle Paul writes this, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. Paul is writing in a context, he's writing to a church where there were factions and divisions, there were groups and camps who were emotional and and in opposition to each other because there were strong debates about the most faithful way to follow Christ in their current circumstances. And the Apostle Paul says to them, in the midst of that circumstance, do you want to really praise God? Accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. The word accept in the Greek language means to grab and to pull something towards yourself as your own. I I am accepting this piece of paper. I am grabbing it and claiming it as mine by pulling it close. 
In the context of relationships, it could mean something like to embrace somebody literally or figuratively as yours, as belonging to you, as one of your people, to embrace someone as family. The Apostle Paul says in communities and churches where there are factions and divisions, do you know how you bring praise to God? by opening your arms and embracing each other as family, the exact way that Christ has embraced us. How has Christ embraced us? Warts and all. Christ has embraced us forgivingly and freely and fully. Christ has embraced us unconditionally and unwaveringly. What if we were to embrace each other the way Christ has embraced us? us? What if we were to make space for each other, to respect each other, to accommodate each other, to protect each other, to treat each other as though everyone else's interests were literally more important than yours? What if we were to embrace each other in a way that says, I don't care what we disagree about, we're still family? I want us to take a few minutes to come into the presence of God and to think about our posture in relationship to each other, about how we have been engaging with people who disagree with us and about what it would look like to embrace each other the way Christ has embraced us. Let's take a moment and come into God's presence and invite God into our community relationships. And now we want to pause again and make space one more time to respond to what we've heard. I don't know what comes to mind for you when you think of extending grace in places and relationships where it's hard to do so. And maybe there are even specific faces that come to mind, people for whom it's difficult for you to want to open your arms up to, or to give that grace and mercy and, and the benefit of the doubt to. It's so easy for us to do this to one another in the face of clashing perspectives. I mean, actually do that with me right now, if you will. Go ahead and cross your arms. Feel how that feels? Like so much of this feels good to me, especially when I think I'm in conflict. The thing is, while, while this usually appears kind of aggressive and even strong, it's actually a self-protecting stance. It, it looks like a barrier against the other, but actually has way more to do with trying to protect things inside of you that feel threatened, things that are afraid. And so the real question is, what is it you might be trying to protect that's preventing you from being able to fully extend open-armed grace? And what are the fears, the hurts, the previous experiences maybe? Are the things you don't want to let go of that are causing you to buckle down instead of open up? Are there character pieces that are struggling, thoughts or values that I need to be challenged? You know, what is hindering you from being able to follow Jesus all the way into wholehearted grace? I know I've got some things. So let's take another 30 seconds of quiet now and just see if you can identify anything that's holding you back. And go ahead and actually leave your arms crossed as you do. I mean, it's an honest posture. But try to figure out your real wise. Now, we could choose to stay like this, arms crossed, barriers made, self-protected. But we know this isn't the Jesus way. 
This isn't love. We asked you to grab some communion supplies today at the start of the service because we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper together here. You might notice we can't do that very well with our arms like this. I mean, we can't do that at all with our arms like this or with our hearts and our minds like this. And so I'd like to lead us in a short moment of prayer, knowing that I need to let some things go before I can enter into communion wholeheartedly. If you do too, then I'll invite you as I pray to intentionally make a choice to uncross your own arms, to hold them open and let that become part of your prayer too. To God, I'm sorry for the ways I have set up barriers, made judgments, drawn lines that divide me from people who you love and who I love and who I want to love. I've crossed my arms in order to feel more safe, but instead it has made us all more unsafe. So now I choose to uncross my arms, to hold my life open, and to make my heart a safe space for everyone, not just me. In Jesus' name and in Jesus' spirit, I pray. Amen. So now with our arms free to receive, if you'd like to celebrate communion today, if that's where you're at in your faith, you can go ahead and grab your, your juice and your bread now and hold them in your hands there together. If you're not in that place or if this is all new to you, there's no pressure at all here. So feel free to just take a pass or maybe you even want to use these moments to reflect on where you're at with God and to consider whether opening your arms up a little wider in that direction might be something that you're ready for. I love this particular communion invitation by writer Brian Zond. He says, this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come because it is the Lord's will that those who want him shall meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's receive it together now. Thank you, Jesus, for how you love us. May we learn to love one another in the very same way. Amen. Now we're gonna take in a new song that reflects everything we've been talking about, refusing to let our differences divide us so that we will see Jesus live and breathe and move among us.
badly in 